Come here, come here. I want to share with you guys. I forgot your first name, brother. Ralph. Ralph. I won't do that again because I just embarrassed myself. <laughs> okay. So, right? yeah. I've learned if I'll embarrass myself, I don't forget near as much. Right? Okay. But this is Ralph, guys. He started coming. And he came up last week and he said, I'm going to start tithing. I know the Lord's leading me there. And this is what I told him. I said, man, this is one of the scriptures I'm so confident in that the Bible says, test me in this. I said, if you'll tithe for 90 days, if God doesn't start working, the church will write your check back in full. Because it ain't me, in my opinion, and I'm going to be honest with you, it's not my money or your money keeping the lights on. Right. You know whose money it is? It's God's, okay. but it takes everybody in here. I'm just going to be honest with you. You think you're, if you leave, God sends in another. I'm just being honest with you. We've been doing this a long time. But God lets you get to be a part of changing the world. But then what happens is this. God, at the point, blesses you to where you can bless more. Right. That's what it's about. Yeah. So I want to pray with you as I pray over everybody in here. Because okay. you didn't just put yourself on the line. I mean, I'm saying, mm. I don't know if I opened my big mouth. No, I'm glad or, you or if, Or if... Um, you know, said, or if, uh, but making the commitment to get back, I'm so convinced that God will do that. Oh, yeah. I ain't concerned. All right? Yeah. So if yeah. you're here and you say, Cricket, I'm not made that move yet. Man, you carry a lot of stress on your shoulders of trying to keep things financially together on your own. Let me let you know something. There's help available. And if you'll just simply try it, I will make the commitment. You can write it on your card today. On your, all right, if you start tithing today to try it. I'm not saying you're committing to it. You're trying it. God said, test me in this. There's some things I like to, you ever seen a 30-day money-back guarantee on TV? You ever ordered anything that would give it, and so you got it, and it wasn't what they said it was, so you could send it back and get your money back? I'm telling you, God's word works. And if you try it, I'm confident enough in it that if it don't work for you, I'll give you it back. I ain't keeping it anyway. It ain't my money. <laughs> I ain't, but that's the way it's going to work. Okay. And I'll make the same commitment to anyone in here. God's word works. So, Father God, I thank you that you didn't stick us out on this thing and expect us to make you happy on our own. But, God, you gave us clear and easy steps to take that we know we can take them and it pleases you. But not only does it please you, it allows you to get involved in situations that we can't change on our own. Lord, I thank you that for every person that is tithing, bringing what is yours back to you, Lord, I thank you that you're keeping your promise. You're opening the windows of heaven and pouring out blessings that storehouses can't contain. And that you're rebuking the devourer for their namesake, cars, vehicles, things are working. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to tell you something what the Lord just told me about what you share. I'm not going to say any of that. But the reason things got turned upside down because if they didn't nothing would ever change That's right. so sometimes the breaking of ground is not a bad thing mm -hmm. but it hurts sometimes but what it does is allow God to grow something out what was hard before that area you talked about I'm telling you God said I'm doing something there okay Thank you. I God love you you, you are blessings Ralph Thank you are part of this church alright moms as you continue on we, this says song here, but we don't have to do that because we're so far gone still. I'm going to bring Jen on up real quick. And moms, I want to right now turn and honor you the best I can. And the way I can do that is I would love to give you all a bouquet of roses because that's how important you are. But I can give you at least one. So if our girls will come up and our ushers will come up, but all of our women, please stand. We, can I tell you the warfare today? Man, we walked in this building planning on having service, and how many guys got on your computers at home today? Microsoft 10 decided to do an update across the nation last night, and man, yeah, Brandon was Googling it before. Everybody's complaining about our computers don't work. We can't get stuff going. It took literally two hours for Brandon to be able to get this screen right here up because of the change in and Microsoft and all that. It's like, Lord, I'm glad I don't own a tech company tomorrow because Monday's going to be rough, all right? But so if we're kind of getting off kilter, Mom, it's not because we didn't prepare. It's because we've been fighting for you, all right? So we can do that. So mothers, women of all ages, would you simply stand to your feet and let our men give you a big hand clap while we give you a rose. Ushers, if you will, Jerry, there are kids. And...
while they're doing that, I'm going to combine this too. I want you to walk back to that back row. See Miss Monica in the purple shirt? Go give her her rose. And I want everybody in here to see this miracle going all the way back there. And her giving that rose. The fact that this baby is walking is a miracle of God. And every day her walk gets better to the point they tell you, you won't even see a limp. Give God a big hand clap. Baby, this church has been praying for you. And she's here with us today. So moms, right here, baby, all these are moms. Give them all their roses. Now, Mother's Day for some is a, and you can sit down as soon as you get a rose because they're coming. I want them to be able to find you all. And I know that you're here today, moms, and you being here is a big deal. But I also know what's another big deal is that if you're here today and your mom has went on to be with the Lord, Don, I remember going to your mom's funeral. I can't imagine the hole that is left when mom goes before you. So if you're here today and you've lost your mom, I want you to know that mom's looking down today and she's got the biggest smile she could ever, you could ever imagine her having because you are where she desired you to be the whole time she was here. You are in the presence of God. I've never met a mom that didn't want their kids to make it to heaven, never. Even some of the roughest ones I have. And mom's happy today. So I just want to pray over you real quick. Father God, I ask you, for all those that are feeling grief, feeling loss, feeling loneliness on Mother's Day because moms went before. Your word says, God, that you're closest to the brokenhearted. So right now I ask Holy Spirit for you to go into each situation, each circumstance, and you let each person know it in a unique way that mom is still actively involved in their life, interceding and praying. It may be from heaven, but she don't have to get her prayers near as far anymore. She can walk into the throne room of God and make known her petitions. And I thank you today, God, you're allowing people to know. Holy Spirit, you're letting them see glimpses that mom is still here in Jesus' name and involved in their lives. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm going to now, because we're so far off base, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to the prettiest preacher I have ever ever met in my entire life and I said you know it's crazy how kids change because every one of our children we had when they first came into the world mom worked harder for them but they liked daddy more have you ever noticed that it was crazy Carl did that happen at your house for the first five years of their life mom changed diapers and made nasty gross food and cleaned it up off the floor and all. but when I would come home she would get so excited, all right? And then what happened, though, is I got to be, I got to enjoy all her hard work. But somewhere around seven or eight, me and this one, come here, Haley. Last week, me and this one were riding in the car the other day. Now, I don't care not how you do it, but we do it like this. These girls were not allowed to wear makeup or get cell phones until they were 12, all right? This one just turned 12. So this used to be my buddy. I mean... If we go different places all the time, or we go to the same place in different cars, and this one would always be daddy, but roll with me all the time. We bought a phone the other day, all right? And so we get in the car to go to Birmingham, and it's a five-hour drive, and Isla jumps in the front seat with me. Haley gets in the back, and we drive five hours, and she did not say one word. <laughs> and so I let it go because it was a Friday night, and I knew she was tired from school. So the next morning, we got back in my truck, me, Isla, and this one, she got in the car, back seat, laid down and got her phone out, and I stopped the car, didn't I? And I said, all right, baby. I said, you've been daddy's girl all these years. And I said, only thing we've changed is a phone, and you're not talking to daddy no more. I said, so if the phone's going to keep you from talking to dad, that's my phone. I said, because I'm not going to lose my daughter. I said, so that's, that's what we're going to do. And so she got real quick up there talking to me. And then I learned this. She started talking to me like she talks to mom because they talk in a way that's totally different. Moms, let me encourage you. Yeah, that right now, Isla is daddy's girl. She'll tell you she's daddy's girl, and I mess with Jen all the time. I'm like, hey, who's your best? And she'll be like, you, but don't tell mom because she gets mad. Right? <laughs> the truth is this, though. The way God's made it is mom nurtures them so they can know the father. But understand that just knowing the dad's not enough, 
the relationship between mom and daughters or sons is the way God intended your relationship with the Holy Spirit to be. So this is never in competition with this. Moms, you need to know this. Because what you are in their life, she can't be. That's why single moms, you don't got to worry. God will still be the father because you can't be. But I can't be what she is. And so be comfortable in who you are. Because what God's using you... If When it came to God's plan working, Jesus went back to the Father. We left the Holy Spirit here because we would never know who God is if He wasn't. And all the attributes the Holy Spirit carries, you're doing a good job. If I could say anything, I just want you to know, you're doing a good job. Here's you. Oh, that's yours. Okay. All right. So I am so excited to be here with you guys this morning. I tell you what, it has, so I left in November, it was November, December, and then we found out December 14th that I was going to have to have surgery. So my plan was to come back before we knew that, you know, in January, February, but God knew the end from the beginning, praise God. And God did such a miracle in her life. And like Rick said, we are so thankful. We're so thankful for your prayers. We're so thankful that God made a way when we didn't know there was a way, when we weren't told there was a way. But God brought us to the right place in the right time with the right person, and God made a way. Amen? But today I want to share a word for the women in here, the women and men. I don't know about you guys, but I think this is true for most women in the room. There's nothing worse in our life than when we believe a lie and we don't realize it's a lie. Then we find out it's a lie and it makes you angry, doesn't it? It makes you angry when you believe something for so long and it's not true. You know, women are faced with this. And I say this to the guys in the room too because they may not be aware of it. So... A lot of what we see in our society today has been put into our world, hidden behind the guise of just an all-out lie. Today, we are going to break that lie because the Word of God tells us, without knowledge, my people will perish. Amen? And so we have to have the knowledge of Him, the knowledge of this Word, but we also have to have the knowledge when we are being lied to by the enemy. Amen? And God will... Open the eyes of our understanding in those areas when we seek him in that. So today, that's what I'm here to do. Today, I want to share with you guys a lie that has been out there, a lie that's been out there for a long time. It's infiltrated our society. It is the direct reflection of, if going back, why we're seeing a lot of the things that we're seeing today. A lot of us believe it to be one thing when it was really promoted and put out there about 60 years ago as something else. And so today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about that lie. And why are we going to talk about that lie? And why are we going to reveal the truth? Because it has been holding a lot of women hostage. See, I don't know, men, if you guys know this or not. And I'm speaking to those men who are godly men, who are strong men in the Lord, who want to see their wives and their families happy and whole going forward in the kingdom together as one. See, I don't know if you fully understand the battle that is going on for godly Christian women. So I want to kind of give you a little bit of background and some insight into why you're seeing some of the stuff you see. Why does it seem as though it's even coming at you and it's coming at women? We have to understand where it originated. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. I was sitting in a service, and, and I'm blessed to have godly men in my life. I'm blessed with a godly husband, but I'm also blessed with godly, as Cricket had mentioned early, pa- earlier, pastor in my life. And see, who you sit under matters. Who you sit under matters, and you have to be aware of what you're sitting under, right? And so um, today I want to talk about, and I I had to use Cricket Sage on this. He was born in 1974. I want to ask a question you should never ask before I get started, but be proud of it. How many women in the room are over the age of 65 in here? We have a couple. You don't have to raise it. Amen. Amen. We have a couple. And the reason I asked that question, there's a few, but the reason I asked that question is because they are going to remember this. 
But the scary part is, if you've got to be over 65-ish to have an understanding of this, that means everyone that coming, is coming after is just hearing what has trickled down. See, there is a thing in 1971 called the feminist movement. Does anybody over the age of 65 remember that? You remember that. And a lot of women today, I think, will agree with me on one thing. And a lot of godly men will agree with me on one thing. The abuses and the atrocities against women is not okay. That is not God. And we can all agree on that. We can all agree at those harsh things that we see, those lies that women are told, those lies that women tell themselves. But see, back then they were told, you have an alternative. You can either fall prey to that or you can be a part of this. Well, let me give you a declaration because we know this stuff comes back to spiritual warfare. And you may say, you know, I feel a little bit a part of that, but something just doesn't sit right with me. I don't agree with everything they say. There's a lot of women that feel that way. They don't agree with the abuse, the injustice, the atrocities, any of that. But yet something doesn't sit right with that movement. And let me tell you why, if you're a woman of God, because, praise God, knowledge, God gives us knowledge because without knowledge, my people will perish. I'm going to read you a direct quote of why that may not sit well with you today. In 1971, here was the declaration. My pastor gives a lot of declarations and words of knowledge. I want to hear, I want you to hear this morning, because if you're under the age of 65, you may have never heard this. The declaration of the feminist movement. They said, and I quote, this is the end of the institution of marriage. It is necessity, necessary for the liberation of women. Therefore, it is important to encourage women to leave their husbands, not live with men. All of history must be rewritten in terms of opposition to women. We must go back, and here's the scary part. Here is the part why you cannot, as women of God, get on board with this. We must go back to the ancient female religions like witchcraft. That is what it was rooted in. I'm going to tell you there are a couple of more quotes, if you're a researcher, that I can't even read from this stage because they are so blasphemous against God. That is an anti-God movement that has trickled down through the generation under the guise of, of women not being abused, which we all agree with. So it's very confusing, right? We get confused by the enemy, but that's what it was born in. That's why you can't get on board with it. They said this, you either choose feminism or you choose masochism. What they're saying is you either go with us or you're siding with the abusers. And that is not true. There is a third option. And I want you to hear from my pastor, a man, a man of God, on what that is. You guys want to play the video? You got to bear with us. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. There's been technical. We are praying it comes through. It's an amazing video. This was from a service a couple of weeks ago. I want to concentrate for the next 15, 20 minutes on the last part of my message. This has to be addressed. It's just a tragedy in my own life that I haven't addressed it more thoroughly than I'm addressing it this morning. There's a strong familiar spirit that travels through family and denominational bloodlines that discriminates against females. It operates covertly. It operates under the guise of religion. It gains power because it's covert and hadn't been dealt with. Women, the female gender, have been vexed somewhat. Not all of them, but many of them have. By familiar spirits that has become a normal voice 
that they heard her, had, they have heard for many, many years, maybe since childhood or infancy. When it comes to a female's place in society, many things have worked against the females. They do the same job as a male, but their counterpart, the male, tends to be paid much more than the females paid much less. Many promotions come in the secular world and corporate world, and it usually goes to the male. Rarely goes to the female. Females are very suited, very qualified for certain positions, but they've been overlooked time and time again. And this is not the least. I'm talking about secularly. I want to talk about females in the body of Christ. There's a call on many females' lives, but they've been penalized. They've been shut down. They're only allowed to operate in the call of God that God has placed upon their lives in a very restrictive way, mainly ruled over by a male masculine world. In the secular world, they call it gender discrimination, but I prefer to call it gender familiarity because it's familiar spirits that has dogged women for years. It's a familiarity that generationally travels through vehicles of sexism, religion, abuse, and downright harassment against women. Familiar spirits cause basically all women to battle low self-esteem, and all the things that I just mentioned. Many women, many, many women don't feel beautiful although they are. And I want to take the time to shed light on this familiar spirit that harasses women that's trying their best to work for God without having to battle everybody else in the meantime. So who did God use to bring down wicked Haman he used Queen Esther to go in before the king and her intercession saved the Jews. It was the intercession of Esther that saved the Jews from wicked Haman. It says, Mordecai told them to answer Esther, don't think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, he told her, relief and deliverance will rise from some other place that you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this, he told. Mordecai told Esther. And for many decades, women have been the pillars of the church. If somehow a telegram or an email could go out to women in all churches around the nation and the nations, that next Sunday, sit down and don't open your mouth, you'd be surprised how dead church would be. You'd be surprised. Many decades, women have been the pillars of the church, but yet we're trying to restrict them. If women were to sit down and to close their mouths and their purses, I said, and their purses, Ministry would shut down, basically. God gives five gifts to the church. He said, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Let me tell you what the fivefold gifting is. It is not a male-dominated thing. Let me tell you what the ministry of the fivefold is. It is an anointing that can rest on a female or a male. Do you understand what I'm saying? What does the Bible say? It says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, 
There is neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. We're one in Jesus Christ. So let me just say this. You might say, well, I don't believe in women apostles. Well, it doesn't make any difference whether you do or not. They're still women apostles. There's places in Africa that a man can't be found, but God saved a woman, filled her with the Holy Spirit. She felt a burden to do something for God. She began to establish churches, and she began to found churches and to send pastors out and to start other churches in other places. That's what an apostle does. You don't have to be called an apostle. You just do the work of the apostle. And many women in other nations, not so much in America, but many women in other nations have done the work of an apostle for years and have started churches and have been pioneers and they've done the job, but we haven't recognized them. Many people have been pastors. Many women have been pastors, but they felt guilty about it every time they get up behind the pulpit because of the way people make them feel. Let's stop this nonsense in Jesus' name. It is a familiar spirit that's trying to put women down and shut their mouth. But in the name of Jesus, I command you to rise up and open your mouth. <laughs> women... Apostles are innovators, they're visionaries. They start things and turn things over to others after they start them. That's what an apostle does. An apostle is not a position, it's a gift. Man does not give this to you, only God can give you the anointing to be someone in the fivefold gift. Look at this. Jesus said this, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad, and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Let's transfer that word fruit to works. A tree is known by its works. A person is known by its works. If you're doing the work of an apostle, you have to be an apostle. Deborah was a prophet who judged Israel, and the Bible tells us that she was the wife of Lepidoth and she was judging Israel at that time. But Barak needed somebody and he couldn't find it in another male. So Barak said to her, to Deborah, if you'll go with me, I'll go, but if you will not go with me, I'm not gonna go. Deborah said to Barak, up, up. This is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand, has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots and all of his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as that word. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword and not a man was left. Pastors. Women pastors. The apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans, he said, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church. I looked up that word prostatus, prostatus. It means a helper. She's a servant, a shepherd of the church that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints. Even Paul back then was wrestling with it. Receive Phoebe in a manner that's honorable and assist her in whatever business she has need of you for she's been a helper of many and myself also. And he's trying to get them to recognize Phoebe's calling. Evangelist, women evangelist. It's interesting in Samaria, there was a woman there that had a water pot. She came to Jesus, or Jesus came to her and he said, give me a drink. The disciples are going away into the city to buy food. And the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealing with Samaritans? Jesus answered and said unto her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said unto him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well 
and drank from it himself as well as the sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the woman, uh, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman, look here, the woman left her water pot. What was the water pot? Everything she'd been used to. She went to draw water. She was a Samaritan. She was a dog according to Jewish standards. But Jesus dignified her and he prophesied to her. He told her about the woman, about the man that she's living with is not her husband. And the Bible said she was so touched. She left her water pot. She, she was so touched and so lifted by Jesus that she left behind everything she knew. And it said, she went into the city and she said to the men, look at this. She said to the men, Jesus didn't come to a man. He went to a woman. She come and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? She's given an altar call right there. Could this be the Christ? And they went out of the city and came to him. Hey, they came to Jesus because of a woman preacher. The words, the words of an ostracized woman in a male-dominated society caused men to come to Jesus. A woman ostracized from society. She's a Samaritan and she's a woman. And God used her and gave her the opportunity to bring a city to his feet. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my God, let me say this. If Jesus took a chance on them, how dare you not take a chance on them? And the Bible says this, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. Hey, how did they believe on him? Because a woman told them about him. Because the word of the woman who testified, he told me all I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. A woman can get a man to do anything. <laughs> and many more believed on him because of his word. And they said to the woman, now that we believe, not because of what you told us, but because you brought us to him and we heard him, and we now know indeed that this is the Christ, the Savior of the world. It's all laid at the feet of the Samaritan woman, an evangelist. Ladies, you hear me. I believe in you. The second preacher that I ever remember hearing in my life was a woman preacher. Her name was Mildred Shelley. She was full of the Holy Ghost. And when I would hear that woman preach as a boy, I would feel power, sizzling power when she preached. Mildred Shelley, I went to school with her son, went to high school with her son. She was an evangelist, a woman evangelist. Back in the day when women didn't call themselves an evangelist, but our pastor loved her, let her preach for him regularly, many times. What about you? What about you? What about you? I chonder, sitting right there listening to me. Right chonder. What about you? Are you a preacher? Who told you you're not a preacher? I'm telling you. If Amen. Amen. I tell you, if you guys don't know who that is, that's Pastor John Kilpatrick. He, um, you may have heard of him from the Brownsville Revival. That was actually before I came to know who he was. So I was a little bit younger back in that day. But I tell you, we sat in that service, and you could, as you could see through most of it, you couldn't hear a pin drop. And here's the thing. Here's the reason I wanted to reveal to you first the difference between the feminist movement and a strong, powerful woman of God. See, the enemy is after, number one, we know with that, the family. He's after men, he's after women, and he's after children of God. And I tell you, when you come up against 
that kind of spirit and that kind of evil. It's why women feel insecure. It's why they question, I have to be this way or that way. It's why men feel beat down, feel not good enough, feel not heard, because there is all of this confusion behind what is going on. There is a difference between a strong, powerful woman of God and the bitter, angry, evil, feminist spirit that was rooted in what I read to you. That that quote that initiated it, the foundation that it stood on said, we have to leave God and turn to witchcraft and evil. That was out of their own mouths. That's what they proclaimed. That's what they were proud of. It was anti-God and it was anti-family. So let me ask you this. What are we struggling with today in our society, in our country, in our world? An attack on family, an attack on women, and an attack on godly men. You know, there's so many different adjectives and words that I could use to describe a godly woman, so many. And there's so many adjectives and words I could use to describe a godly man. But I tell you this, in the body of Christ, it is so, so important that we know, you know, I tell the girls this, as they're beginning to get a little bit older, we have a 14, almost 15-year-old, and now 12-year-old, um, of course, and a little one. But as they get older, we start talking about relationships. First and foremost, that person that you're with, do they have a faith and a belief in God? Because it will matter. And that's not just men. That's women, too. The women that are in your life, do they believe in God? What are they rooted in? What is their source? What is their belief? Because it will affect you also. And so he had mentioned, and I want to mention a couple of these women. He had mentioned um, Deborah, Esther, and I want to talk about three today really quickly. But I do believe this is important to get an understanding of what we are facing today. See, we talk about, about this a lot at the church that I attend there in Daphne. But, you know, something happened that day in 1971. Something happened. Who in here believes that our words that we speak have power? So what happens when hundreds, then thousands of women get behind that? Who are they glorifying? They're glorifying the devil. They're glorifying the enemy. They're glorifying witchcraft. Some of these quotes that were spoken are so bad, I can't even bring myself to read it in church because it is so bad. But you can find it. They're proud of it. They're proud of that. So we as women of God have to stand and be proud of what the word of God says. We have to fight back against the agenda that was placed so many years ago because we can see the inroads into our society now. Why do we have the inroads of the things that we are facing? The tearing apart of families. No, no belief that God can help people through their situation. Why are we facing so much anger, so much bitterness, so much frustration, so much hostility, so much murder? Why are we facing these things? Because somebody decided a long time ago to begin to speak, to begin to teach, and to begin to bully women into believing you either have to be like us and align with this or you must be over here defeated victim, being okay with abuse, being okay with that. God is not okay with any of that. That's why I wanted you to see that video today because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And I'm going to be so as bold to say it this morning because I know, me and you may not know this, but I know this topic that I'm speaking about now in here, and yes, I know it's live here, is not going to be popular with a lot of women, but that's okay because it has to be said. It ha the truth has to be revealed because without knowledge, my people will perish. The abuse, the injustice that he was talking about is never okay. But saying that anything else besides God is our source, knowing who God is, is of the devil. It's of the enemy. And those words that were spoken and that agenda that was pushed that make us feel inadequate and inferior because we don't align with it is a lie. And I'm here to say it's a lie. And it is time that we as women of God stand up for what we know that God has called us to do. And what has he called us to do? He has called us to love our families. 
He has called us to love our godly husbands. He has called us to get behind them and love them. Because we know that men all like to seem tough, and they are tough. I'm not saying they're not. But it's our job to hold them up when we see them going through something hard. It is our job to be there for our kids. But, you know, I think about three daughters, all right? And this doesn't matter if you have sons or daughters because living in today's society, it is a battle and a war no matter if you're raising sons or daughters to raise godly sons or godly daughters. But as a woman of God, and when I say woman of God, what I mean is I love God with all of my heart. I gave my life to Jesus. And I regularly, on a regular basis, say, God, I give you my children. God, I ask you into this situation because I can't do it. So I've given my life, my kids, over to God. So if that's you today, this is for you. You know, the funny thing about Deborah and Esther, and this may resonate with some of you guys, when we look throughout the Word of God and we see a lot of these great men, they give us these lines and pages of their lineage, right? The son of somebody, 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 a bunch of names we can't say. We've all seen that. But if you look and you search, Deborah, a great prophet, a judge of Israel, we don't know much about her. You can't go back in a big, long line lineage history she comes on the scene in the book of Judges, right? So we look at Esther. We do know something about Esther. We know that her mother and her father died, and Esther comes on the scene. I know there are so many women that God used in this world. I don't know where they came from. I don't know their background. But God uses them in a mighty and powerful way. When you look, I'm going to start here. We have to first say this in Joshua 15. There is a, a cry given, and I want to give it today for women, for moms. We have to first make one decision in Joshua 15. Choose this day who you will serve. We have to make the choice. Are we serving God or are we serving the world? And a lot of that choice comes into who are we going to follow, who are we going to serve, but then what are we going to begin to believe, and what are we going to teach our children? What are we going to teach them about who God is? And what are we going to show them about who God is? You know, in the Bible, it says um, in 14, just before, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in all sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that the God your father served before the river. And it, if, it's, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day who you will serve. He had mentioned this, the woman with the water pot. She had to choose to set that down and leave what she had known. I can tell you, women, it is not an easy road, but there is so much blessing in it. For so many of you guys, there has been things in your life that you have had to give up, lay down, or sacrifice for the kingdom and for your children. What I mean by that is this. You may have had to choose at some point one day to leave what you had known because you knew it was not of God. That can be a relationship in your life. I know women that have had to make hard choices, but God has blessed them beyond belief because they chose him and they walked towards him and they walked away from those things that the enemy had done in their life. They walked away from those belief systems that they had. They walked away from maybe the way that they were raised and the beliefs that they had that were wrong about them, that were wrong about the life that God had called them to and they have turned to God and they have said, I choose you. I believe that we are living in a time, like he said with Esther and Mordecai, you know, Esther, as I mentioned, you did not know much about Esther. You knew that her mother and father had died and Mordecai had raised her. We saw her come into this place to save the Jews. But here's the thing. She had to make a choice also. When word came to her through Mordecai, through a soldier, of what was happening to the Jews, she was hesitant at first. She was reluctant. She said, I can't go before. We're not allowed to go before the king unless we are called. And Mordecai let her know, don't think 
that you're going to escape this. Don't think that your fate won't be the same as the Jews. But what if God has placed you here for such a time as this? See, we're not going to escape what is going on in this world if we choose to agree with what the world says. We are not going to escape it by being quiet and not using our voices, by agreeing with it, by saying it's okay, by saying those injustices are going to be okay. Because the truth of the matter is, I believe, especially after the research and reading what I read was going on in the 1970s, that we all sitting in this room today and our children were put here to have a voice for women of God. And to speak against what those inroads and those roots that were laid out so many years ago. Have you ever heard of the statement of someone say, you know, it sounds good. Some of it sounds pretty good, but you just knew there wasn't something quite right about it. Has anybody ever faced that? You know, you're hearing something, it kind of sounds right, but there's a lot at the the root of it that is not right. And so, women of God, it is time that we stand up. And I do believe, just like Esther, God is calling us to say that we were born for such a time as this. There's one more story I want to talk about really quick. Had a lot of notes here. Like Cricket said, we had, I tell you, (laughs) there's always some chaos when God is trying to deliver his words and stuff that tries to stop it. But you know, in Acts 16, we hear of Lydia, but I'm actually not going to talk about Lydia today. I'm going to talk about a different scripture here, and I believe it is in Acts 16. 16, 16. I'm sorry, let me pull that up. thought I had it saved in here in the app. Let's see. But the reason I want to talk about this... Oh, okay. All right. um, All right, so we see Paul come here. Let's see. Okay, it says, Now it has happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought up her master much profit and fortune telling. You can keep going. I'll read it. This girl followed Paul and us and cried saying, These men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way to salvation. And this she did for many days. So she kept hounding them as they were speaking the word of God. She kept hounding them as they were telling them about God. Paul got greatly annoyed, right? This lady who is possessed by something. She's angry. She's bitter. She's unhappy. So she's following him around and following him around. So he was annoyed. And he turned to that spirit because he recognized it was a spirit. And he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But I want to go on to the next one. But when her master saw that their hope for profit was gone, spirit of divination is like fortune teller, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. I'm going to stop right there. Do you see what happened there? Men of God, women of God, were proclaiming God. They were proclaiming what was going on. She, that spirit in her, she couldn't handle it. She got angry. That's why that spirit of the world comes out when men are speaking about God, when women are speaking about God. It's angry. It's frustrated. It's going to dog you. It's going to hound you. It's going to try and stop you from the mission that God has for your life. Finally, he got annoyed, though, and he spoke to that spirit. And he said, get out of her. And you know what happened? It did. But then something that something happened there. It wasn't the woman who was delivered and who was free from that bondage that she was in. It was people that were profiting off of her profiting off of her being bound, profiting off of her being a slave to them. They got mad because they weren't going to get a profit off this broken person anymore. And so what did they do? They turned on the men and they took them and it says, but her master saw that the hope for profit was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Then they got, got a group in there against them to throw them into jail. See, ladies, here's here's a question I have for you this morning. Whatever is keeping you bound, 
whatever lie that you are believing, whatever the enemy is trying to convince you of, don't allow the enemy to profit off of it. And when you get free from that thing, remember this. God is a good God. And when you cry out to him, he will free you from that bondage that you were in. But be careful of relationships and people in your life that may be profiting off you being broken, wanting to keep you where you are because it benefits them in some way. That is not God. That is the world. God wants you to be free. God does not want you to be bound. God wants you to love your family and love your husband. God wants those things. And the world is going to do whatever it can do to convince you to keep you in the lie that you're bound by. But remember this, remember when you have those in your life who are praying over you, who are agreeing with you, godly husbands, godly pastors. I say godly because there is a difference. Not everyone has the heart of God and not everyone's motives are pure. But when you have a godly man or a godly pastor or a godly person in your life and they are praying over you and you are delivered out of that thing, don't let the other things around you that are trying to profit off you tear them down. That's where we've got to stand up as women of God and begin to intercede and use our voice and pray and stand up for strong men of God because unfortunately in our society today, that's getting fewer and fewer. They are being beat down. They are being told it's wrong to be masculine. They are being told it's wrong to be strong men of God. And we have got to stand up to those voices, men or women, and say, you are wrong. And I will not allow you to rob good, godly men and women out of people's lives anymore. And that's what it's going to take, is to stand up and make this change. But here's something today. Here is what, why I'm so passionate about this. Because I have, and you don't have to have children, You may have people in your life who you are mother figures to. Believe it or not, they are listening to you. They're watching you. But for me, I know at least I have three children, three daughters. And they are growing up in the world today. And I do believe that because our children were born today, God intended them with a purpose, plan, and destiny for today. So that does not scare me because I know that they were born for such a time as this. But because they were born for such a time as this, the words I say, the actions I take are going to directly affect them. And so they're in here today because they may not know about 1971. My oldest was born in 2008. But they're hearing all of this, and they don't know what it's rooted in. I tell you, my oldest is very strong-willed and strong-minded and speaks her mind. I want and I believe and I know and I've got to raise her to put that in a godly direction. Because what if the world speaks into her life more than the truth of the Word of God is spoke into her life? See, God creates our children the way they are for a purpose, plan, and destiny. But if we're not careful... The world is going to teach them a lie and they're going to become something and use what God is giving them for something that was never intended to. And so the first thing we have to deal with for moms today, we, you know, the past couple of Mother's Days, we have had some awesome, awesome topics. We did Lioness Horizon. Who remembers that? Lisa Bevere's Lioness Horizon, talking about the plan and purpose of God. Girls with swords. That was another awesome one that we did one Mother's Day because it was empowering women to go after the call of God on their life. But here's the truth. Now that we know the truth, we've heard the agenda, we've heard the lie. See, women are really great about once we know we've been lied to, we're going to stand for the truth of what we know to be true. We don't like to be lied to and be used to make a fool of. So now we're going to turn to God and we're going to use our voice to speak the truth of the Word of God. But here's the thing. We have to deal with some of what that years and years of what he said. Brokenness, bondage, oppression, abuse. These things are happening in the world. These things are happening to women. And they are very real. And I want to say another unpopular thing that's not going to be popular here. 
We, we see the abuse and things and hear about in the world when it comes to men, but I cannot tell you how many women I hear every day talk about the abuse they face at the hands of other women, whether they talk about them, whether they beat them up, make them feel inferior, make them feel insecure, rob from them, take from them their agendas. See, women are also being attacked by other women. It's not talked about very much. We want to heap it all over here because, yeah, that's obvious. We can see that. But there's a hidden agenda over here. So we as women of God have to join together, realize that we are in this together, and be sure that we are being, that we are being sisters in Christ and that we are encouraging those around us to go after the plan of God for their life. Because the world is trying to steal what God wants to use your life in. So today as we close this service, this Mother's Day service, you know, there are two things that we have to look at. And first we have to realize something. And I saw this analogy last week. And we can begin the music up there because I wanted to end today's service with an analogy. I'm a visual person. Cricket usually does all of the analogies. Um, <laughs> so, But it was so powerful to me because it speaks to what we as women face on a daily basis that we don't talk about, speak about. The men in the room may or may not know about it. But I want to ask my daughters to come up here, my oldest two. Not yet, not yet on the light. We'll, we'll walk that way. Just grab those, those glasses there, girls, each one of y'all. Just the two big ones, Crick. Just the two big ones. I would use the little one, but she can't stand up this long. <laughs> All right. So you've got some, some water in here, girls. How, much, how many ounces do you think that is? 16. How many ounces do you need? I don't know. Okay. So I want you to stand over here, and I want you to stand over here. I want you to hold the water out. Hold it out there. So see, we all carry something with us. We've all got this water. We don't know how many ounces it is. I just turned it on. Girls, I want you to turn around and face the back wall. I know it's strange facing the audience there. And see, they're holding this cup and they're holding this water. You may not know them. You may not know what they look like. But we're all carrying it. And if you carry it now for a few minutes... Like this, you can do that. It doesn't matter what, how much water's in there. You can carry it for a little while. But if I made them stand up here for an hour, it's going to start to get heavy. doesn't matter how much water's in there. But if I made them stand there with it for hours upon hours, their arm would begin to get so weak. It would begin to get numb. It would begin to be weighed down that they could not hold it anymore. It doesn't matter if it's 8 ounces or 12 or 16. You can only carry it so long. You're strong in the beginning. Come on girls, hold it out there. You're they got young arms. Come on. Yeah, but it's heavy. It's already getting heavy. It doesn't matter what you're carrying as women. You're strong. There is no question about that. Women of God are strong because he made you that way. But what you're carrying will weigh you down. And if you hold it long enough, you're going to start shaking. See, she's trying to support that arm with something else. So you're going to have to start supporting that arm with other things. It's going to start shaking. Hold it out there, Lexi. It's going to start shaking. And it's going to get heavy. And they're wrestling. They're struggling to hold it up because they don't know what they're supposed to do next. I haven't told them. I just said hold the cup. How many people in your life are saying, look, you're a strong woman, just hold the cup. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. You don't know what to do next. They're just up here holding it. Hold it up, girls. Hold it up. And that's what the world tells you. Keep holding on to it. Hold on to that anger. Hold on to that abuse that was done to you when you were young. Hold on to that injustice on your job. Hold on to the thing that you secretly cried about when no one else knew. Hold on to that pain. That's what the world tells you. Keep holding it up, girls. Hold it up. That's what they tell you. Be strong. That's what women are told, right? Be strong. But see, that's not what God says. And what I know as a mom and what I know as a woman is, I can tell the girls all day long, you're beautiful. You're created by God. 
but I know they're carrying something. I don't know what it is all the time, because I guarantee you guys, you don't know what all it is. I don't know how much it weighs, but I know it doesn't matter how much it weighs, because eventually they won't be able to hold it anymore. They'll either have to start using other things to keep it up. Bitterness, anger, resentment, it will come out on you, on other relationships. But if they don't use something else to hold it up and they don't have God, what starts to happen is they get too weak. That arm will fall. And if they're really hard-headed, they're really hard-headed and strong, they're going to hold it to the point that that arm gets so numb doesn't really even feel anything anymore because it's been so beaten and it's held on so long it can't hold on anymore but the world is telling them keep holding on you're strong but we've got to give it to God I know for these girls I, I don't pretend as they get older to know everything in their life I'm not with them 24 hours of every day you can't be either y'all stay facing the back here put, your, put the arm out See, they're, uh, they're getting tired. I think I put a lot of water in there. That's more than 12 ounces. But uh, it doesn't matter what you hold. So let me ask you this, girls. And I told them they wouldn't have to talk, so I'm not going to make them talk. But now I just let y'all just nod. Have you ever faced a time in your life when someone has spoke a word to you that hurt your feelings? Have you ever faced a time in your life that someone made you feel not good enough? Have you ever faced in a time in your life when the words of this world made you just want to cry? Have you ever faced a time in your life when you felt like you were carrying something heavy like that glass? When you were carrying something that someone told you It's all up to you. And you felt a weight in your life. Have you have friends that have hurt your feelings? Have you had teachers or authority figures in your life break your heart? I think that was the yes. All right, so I want you to turn around. And they're still holding the glass. They're still holding the glass with smiles on their faces. But when they were turned around, when they were facing the wall and didn't have to look at you guys, they admitted that they've carried this with the cup in their hand and the smile on their face. How many ladies in here, and I'm going to boldly ask you to do something now, for these girls, for the young girls sitting beside you, for the boys out there, how many of you ladies have carried a weight with a smile on your face and you've carried this thing will you please stand see girls I want you to see all these ladies in here that have carried a weight for some a long time they faced some of the things that you faced and you are not alone in it they have carried it for so long But here's the truth, girls. I'm your mama, and y'all know I love you more than anyone, right? Mom Mom and daddy love you more than anybody. But I can't do anything about what's in the cup. Do you know why I can't do anything about what's in the cup? I can't always fix those mean, the mean girls at school or the person that hurts you. Because the truth of the matter is, And I want you to walk this way with me. Ladies, you can sit down because I'm going to ask you to do something else in just a minute. Crick, could you grab that? The truth of the matter is the people in your life that love you and fight for you can't put that cup down for you. They can't ever make you put that cup down. What you have to choose to do, girls, is you have to choose to lay it down. So lay it at the cross. See, I couldn't take that cup. Thank you, girls. I couldn't take that cup, and I couldn't do anything about them. I can tell them about God. I can tell them about Jesus, but I can't take anyone's cup and set it down for them. 
So my question to you today here is, and you can continue the music. My question to you here today in the altar call, most of the room stood up. And that's a very honest look at what women face. I want to ask you two questions here today. Because we are going into battle as women. I'm going to make a declaration here before we do this altar call. Because I believe that we are going to declare it together. And I don't want you just to stand. But as I read this, because we are going to break two things here today. As I read this, and when you hear something in this that resonates with you, ladies, moms, I want you to stand. If Once you hear something that resonates with you. And this is a declaration. This is something that my pastor does at our church when he speaks what is going to be. And he speaks against what the enemy has lied to people about for, for generations. I declare today there is a generation of women rising up that we are women that will not be a part of what that 1970s feminist movement of anger, bitterness, and anti-God, anti-family movement try to do to this world. We will stand for our belief in Him. We will give it to Him. We will give our lives to Him. We will give our families to Him. And as you hear something that you agree with, I ask you to stand. We will raise our children to be a reverent, respected fear of God. We will not bow to the confronting of this world, but we will be to, we will not conform to what this world is telling us, but we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds. It's time for the women of God to stand against this anti-God, anti-Jesus move, movement that this world and their agenda is trying to push on us, that claims we must worship false things, that we must bow to idolatry, that we must hate all men, all women, and our children of this world. I proclaim today that we are warriors of God. We choose this day who we will serve. We will not bow to bitterness. We will not bow to anger. We will not bow to oppression as those who are cloaked in false things and want to lie to us. We will not allow things to destroy our family, to destroy our children, to destroy our city any longer. We choose God today. We will not bow to lies. We will not bow to abuse. We claim our right by God as his children under the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ to stand on the word. We choose love. We choose joy. We choose peace. We choose patience. We choose kindness. We will no longer apologize for being women of God. We will stop apologizing. We will no longer bow to that spirit. We will in this hour be strong, steadfast, teach our daughters and our sons that they have a choice other than this feminist anti-God agenda or abuse. Neither is okay. And we choose that. We choose God. A way that promises a hope and a future the only thing that promises a hope and a future, a way that promises unconditional love, a way that gives our children great purpose and destiny. That is the way I choose to raise my children today. No doubt they will have to fight for what they were born to do, but this fight is with something that the world does not have. They have the choice to fight with the full armor of God. Amen. And because we declare this today, so I declare to the enemy today that you have to take it up with him because I choose to submit my life and my family to him. So you're not at war with me. Your battle is with him and he never loses. So you have already lost. In Jesus' name, amen. And at, praise God. And as we have declared that today, ladies, I tell you what. If there are those this morning that say, man, God has spoke something to me today. But there's, there's two groups I want to speak to today. And in the first one, I want to ask you this, just like the cross. If you are still carrying something this morning with you, a lie that the enemy has told you, something that has got you bound, and something that has got you broken, 
no matter how wonderful that pastor is, no matter how wonderful, godly that sister or that mother or that husband or that father is, they can't lay it down for you. And the longer you hold on to it, it will destroy you. So we've got to lay it at the feet of Jesus. So I want to ask you something this morning, because I know, like I said, mothers, women and mothers, once they know what the lie is, they're going to go directly against what that lie is. If you're holding on to something this morning, I want to invite you, as those girls did, with the cross this morning as a representation, I want to invite you to these altars and say, God, I am laying it down at your feet. I cannot carry it any longer. And that may be hard for you, to, some ladies, to do here today. So I want to call for a second group today. And you may sit down if you want. I know, it, I know it's a long time standing up. But for all of y'all that stood in that declaration and you declared what God was going to do, what you said is, you said, I will not stand for this any longer. I will not be lied to. And I will know who I am fighting for who I serve. This morning, I want to ask you today, I know there's been a lot of standing and there's been a lot of sitting, but it is so, so important. I don't know if you realize this, that those people sitting with you, young and old, see us move, not just hear our words that we speak, but see through our actions what we as women of God do. I just want to invite you this morning as a profession of that stand for the things of God and to stand with God, I just want to invite you this morning as we end this service out to just come to the altar. Join me. We're going to end this service with a prayer. We're going to pray over women. Because, see, it's not just in this service. I don't know if most of you guys know, but we do stream our services live on Facebook. And there are those people who are not able to come into our services, but they are watching. They are watching to see what God is doing. And they are watching to see, and they are watching those who want to stand. So as we begin to enter into this prayer, I want you guys, as women of God, who have stood in recognition that you will stand with God, to come forward as we begin to pray and pray this declaration with me. We say, God, we thank you, Lord, today, God. We thank you, Lord, for freeing every person who is watching this service. We thank you, Lord, by our profession of faith and our standing in you, God, that they may be free today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for giving us our purpose, our calling, and our destiny. We thank you for speaking to us today, God, speaking through that video, speaking through a man of God, the truth for women, that you do have a place, you do have a calling, you do have a destiny. You do have a purpose. But that is no part in abuse. That is no part in injustice. That you as women of God can be strong women of God serving God. And we pray now, Lord, that you cover our daughters. That you cover our children, that you cover our sons, that you cover our husbands, that you cover our pastors, God. And we know, Lord, that you have given us a purpose, calling, and destiny to speak the truth because the truth sets us free from bondage. And we thank you today, Lord, and we come and we have stepped forward in a profession of faith that we have chosen this day who we will serve. And we are standing with you on this Mother's Day, God, proclaiming that we choose you. We stand with you. And by doing that, we will stand for our city. We will stand against injustice. We will stand against lies. We will stand against the oppression of the enemy, God. And we just thank you, Lord, for what you have done in this service today. We thank you for what you have spoken in the hearts of our children. We thank you for what they have received from the worship, from the word, from what was spoken from out in the foyer. We thank you for all those ways, God, that you touch those. And we thank you, Lord, that as you send us out today and as we leave this place, God, that you use us mightily in this city. You use us mightily in our workplace. You use us mightily in our schools and with our children, God. And we give you glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. The word for somebody real quick before we go. I heard the Lord speak to me and says, somebody don't believe this will work for you. 
because you've got too many issues. And I'm here to tell you this. You'll never get it all right. What matters is you get the most important things right. And I want to give you a break. You might have yelled. You might have screamed. You might have grabbed. You might have pinched. I don't know what you got wrong. But by coming up, you got the big one right. You got it right. And he has a way of working over all the little things. You say, Cricket, show it to me in Scripture. A righteous mother falls seven times. But she gets up. Some things are more important than others. And if you'll get the right ones, the big ones right, you'll find out God will take care of the little ones. Father God, I speak a blessing over each mother. That you anoint them. And you will light their tongue on fire with your word right now. That as they speak to their children, as they speak to their families, and as they speak to their world, that they are speaking life from your word. You're giving them the words in their heart to speak out their mouth. And they become life speakers and life givers. And they bring light into a dark world. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Praise God, moms. I'll tell you what, as perfect as she looks, I'm telling you, there's a few flaws she has. But y'all would never know it. But God well, is still you using this. her to change the world, the three little girls. All right? I'm telling you. I was joking with him last week, the girls and I did. He gives me a hard time a lot up here, so we got to give it back, you know. And I said, I don't know what y'all said or did, but a couple of weeks ago, Cricket walks out of the bedroom, coming out the door to leave. He's got a suit in his hand, and we all froze and said, where are you going? He's wearing a suit. That's, I mean, he does not wear a suit much, but I tell you, um, we just thank you guys for praying for our family. We thank you guys for praying for your pastor. We thank you guys for being our family. Families look all kinds of different ways. We have all kinds of family. You know, you have a pastor that comes here, and he drives. That may look different than some other churches. I know I look different than a lot of other pastors' wives. I didn't go to Bible college, and I didn't go the traditional route. But see, I'm like a lot of you guys. I knew a long time ago God, God didn't call me to the traditional way. And he said, you're okay. I have created you the way you are for a purpose and a plan. And so I thank you guys that it may not look traditional it may not look a certain way God, but God uses you guys in such a mighty mighty way. Let me way. let you know say we're going to get the guys on Father's Day because the only reason women ever have a problem submitting with submission is when men won't give them a mission to submit under. When men don't find their mission their women become their enemy because they're a helpmate. I said he anointed her to help me. And so when I'm off mission, her anointing is to help me get on. And if I'm fighting to stay off mission, it comes across as nagging and it comes across as griping. And it comes across as talking. And <laughs> but what happens is really I'm just out of mission. And we're going to deal with the men. When the men get on mission, never met a woman that doesn't want to get behind the mission that God is on. That's why women are more in prevalent in churches than out. So we're going to teach men on Father's Day how to get a mission. So women, if you hear the word submission in your home, don't worry, tell them it's coming because God's about to give you a mission I can get behind. <laughs> and when he does, you don't got to worry. I'll be your biggest cheerleader. Because I, the biggest cheerleader I have is Jennifer when I got a mission. It aligns with why God put me here. And that's first, to raise godly women in our house. She's never fought me on that. Secondly, to be a part of the kingdom mission that God's called us to a church. She's never fought me. And I'm gone a lot now. They more. First 10 years of our marriage, we never spent one night apart. Since then, we've spent as many apart as we've together. That's weird. How could she do that? Because she got under, behind a mission that we knew it was from God. Man, let me challenge you. If you're having a problem with submission at home, Check your mission. If it's so you can play more golf, play more basketball, watch more TV, play more games, hang hey, on, your mission is off course. And she'll quit being your enemy when you get on the right mission. 
So we're going to help you do that on Father's Day, man, in a manly way with wrestlers. And we're doing axe throwing, and I'm trying to get a monster truck to crush a car because I believe this. If men understood how powerful their missions were, they would go after them full speed, as bad as you want them to, women. So, hey, God bless you. May God's face shine upon you, and may he give you peace in everything you do today. You're the greatest thing he ever created. On the, he messed up with me, and he said, that's not completely good. <laughs> so I got to give him something to make it work. And that's what you are, women. Thank you. you God bless you. You guys have a blessed have Mother's, a Day. Mother's Day.